Hello, everybody, and welcome to One Question with Pastor Adam. And I am Adam, and I am pastor to believers and to doubters, to unfaithful Christians and faithful atheists. And friends, Jesus was not afraid of questions, and neither are we here at One Question with Pastor Adam. And so, uh, hey, we are here to talk about the questions of life and faith and the Bible and theology and what is it what is it where are we all going with this thing huh can somebody answer that question for me cuz cuz we need some help with that and one of the books in the bible that uh is often thought is telling us where we are going with this whole thing is the book of revelation <laughs> and there are all kinds of ways to interpret this book uh the last book in the bible it is uh, as you may know, it causes a lot of people a whole lot of anxiety, a whole lot of salvation anxiety, because we have tend to have read it as a map for the end times. But uh, as I have grown and learned about the book of Revelation, uh, it that is not primarily what we are talking about in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a massive political, economic, and religious critique of empire. Oh man, can I get an amen in the chat section? We are going to have some fun today. So hi, Star. Uh, good to see you. We are a little bit early today uh, because of some scheduling conflicts, um, but I am happy to say that we have here one of my dear friends, Dr. Ryan Hansen. And uh, Ryan and I met in seminary. We went to seminary together and met and just uh, had a great time. We were in the same program together. Uh, the program was to go on for uh, a PhD and I quit. I was like, I'm done. Uh, mercy people, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> so, but Ryan uh, kept going and Ryan got his PhD from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and wrote his PhD thesis on the book of Revelation. And uh, you can, you can purchase the book that came out of that PhD thesis. It's called Silence and Praise. I don't know if you can see it on there, but Silence and Praise, Rhetorical Cosmology and Political Theology in the Book of Revelation. Let's go, people. So uh, I am going to bring in uh, my friend, Dr. Ryan Hansen uh, now, and we are going to have uh, a good conversation about the Book of Revelation. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. I am so excited uh, because I read your book and was so fascinated by it. And uh, I'm so glad that you are here. And uh, hi, Kat. Friends, if you have comments or questions for uh, Ryan, uh, you can put those in the chat section. Joshua, you are not dreaming. We are on a little bit early today uh, because we had some scheduling conflicts at our normal time. But uh, here we are talking about the book of Revelation. Ryan, do you want to uh, say anything about yourself before we dive into the book? Sure. Yeah. I, um, yeah, we met in seminary. And um, so I uh, teach now for a few different schools, adjunct online around the country. Uh, I'm uh, leading a small church plant called The Table mm -hmm. in Northeastern Wisconsin, where I am now. So um, doing a little bit of uh, pastoral theology, doing a lot of uh, academic theology online and um, I'm just happy to be here. I'm I I did a lot of work in Revelation. I'd say a lot of my time now is spent with Paul actually. Okay. Um, so but I'm happy to get back into Revelation today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Paul is also known as an apocalyptic uh yes. person of the 1st century, right? What does the word before we dive into the book of Revelation, uh it's also called the apocalypse of John, right? Um right. so what what does this word apocalypse mean? Yeah, apocalyptic apocalypse uh in the popular imagination today usually uh evokes ideas like disaster, destruction, collapse of society, you know, uh, zombie apocalypse, yes. I guess, is the <laughs> popular parlance. Uh, um, but that's just a, kind of a complete misnomer for what that word means in its ancient context. It, it really just means uh, to be revealed, to be unveiled. So it, it has a sense of um, the academic definition of an apocalypse is uh, coined by John Collins. I'm not going to be able to quote it here, but um, 
it's a revelatory literature that gets at the transcendent reality that's behind mm. what we can see, what we can sense with our senses um, into the divine kind of realm. It gives us a it, pulling the curtain back to see what's going on backstage almost. Yeah. Yeah. It, it gives us a uh, kind of a, a behind the curtain scene of what's going on in the divine realm. And, and the divine realm is not something that's primarily somewhere up out there. That's a mystical thing, right? The divine realm is like here it's present among us. Is that, does that sound right for the book of revelation? I think it would be both. And I think okay. there is an aspect of transcendence, spatial transcendence and temporal transcendence out in the future, but it's also not removed, right? It's not meant to be completely otherworldly. The whole reason people write apocalypse is, is to talk about the here and now, Yes, but it's about the unseen, unsensed things going on uh, that you wouldn't normally just see if you yeah. opened your eyes and looked across the street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the thing that your work brings out so well is we we typically think that the book of Revelation is a roadmap for the future, but it, it, it may be both and, right? It might be partly that, but what we tend to miss is the political and economic and religious critique that the book of Revelation is giving of empire. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that, um, uh, first of all, you mentioned like the roadmap idea. I think that's uh, really an unhelpful way to read Revelation. A lot of uh, bad theology comes out of that. A lot of anxiety comes out yeah, of that. Yeah. Uh, many of us probably grew up with hearing, you know, all the biblical prophecy of uh, this event is going to tie to this thing. And that means, you know, all this kind of upheaval and fear, right, is kind yes. of driving that uh, yes. mode. Um, yeah, the, the apocalyptic writers, and John specifically, is writing an apocalypse to speak about the here and now, right? It's a message from the divine realm, which isn't necessarily removed, it's just unseen. It's trans, it transcends what we can see. It transcends our own sense of time. They, they speak about that realm to say something very concrete about the here and now. Um, they're, specifically John's day and the churches he's writing to, he's writing a message to give them hope, to mm. give them a sense of how to navigate uh, the, the political world. Um, so I think um, we've got to see... Uh, yeah, a both and there. There's clearly a future that he's talking about. It's a future of peace. It's a future of mm. uh, benevolent uh, prosperity for all. Uh, I think uh, the death and destruction that's that's in Revelation. That's kind of the obvious stuff, right? That's the mm. obvious stuff for the first century audience of Revelation. That's the obvious stuff for us. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news and yeah. it's bad news, yeah. right? That's not what has to be revealed. The mm. death and destruction stuff is obvious to us. What has to be revealed is that God is working um, despite that to turn it around, to redeem uh, human life and creaturely life um, and to make make a future that is good. Mm. I love it. Uh, hi, Princess and Raileen and Lita. If you all have any questions or comments, please put those in the chat section. You you have to have some comments and questions about the book of Revelation. Let's go, people. Okay, so, um, so Ryan, what is happening in the first century to get John so upset that he is writing uh, this book uh, to these seven churches uh, throughout the empire. What what is what is his? If Revelation is a political critique, what is the politics of the Roman Empire that gets John so upset? Yeah, the the Roman Empire uh, rules by dominating power, um, by dominating peoples, putting down any kind of political dissent. Uh, so that's that's one way the the empire rules. And all empires rule that way, uh, mm -hmm. domination. But another way is um, um, economic extraction of goods from vulnerable peoples and the centralizing of that wealth 
to the elites at the the imperial center. So I've um, never heard of that happening before. Right. Yeah, that's completely <laughs> unfamiliar to us. Right. <laughs> how how are they doing that? What is what, how how does Rome go about doing these things? Um, well, just by sending, you know, uh, battalions and, and okay. occupying forces to places. And, and so then they're in charge and they can uh, exact taxes and, and uh, extract resources. Um, yeah, kind of uh, colonization. Okay. In, in a lot of ways. Yeah. 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 So what's happening in that's also a uh, religious critique. What is happening in the Roman Empire with religion that gets John upset? Uh, yeah, well, so John is a uh, first century Jewish Christian. And so like um, all Jews of his day, uh, idolatry is a problem. Right. So uh, he, he worship, uh, worships Yahweh. He worships Jesus. And um, worshiping uh, idols is a problem for John. And and for John, uh, the idolatry on the one hand and the injustice of Rome on the other hand go together. These are not separate ideas. Um, so to to worship the Roman gods was really to worship Roman power. Mm. And so uh, these go hand in hand. Uh, and, and they did in the ancient world. Uh, Rome... Uh, it's uh, one of the things I trace in my book is the way that um, Roman idolatry really evokes a whole cosmos, a whole cosmology with Rome at the center, Rome on top, uh, that they dominate because the Roman gods want them to. And everything is in its right place when Rome is on top. That's the story Roman uh, worship tells. It's very similar to the prophets of the hebrew bible right their uh, um, conservatives tend to say oh idolatry is just about worshiping the right god uh and that's there's probably truth in that uh liberals progressives say that idolatry is more about like uh justice um and there's truth in that too uh and the problem with idolatry is uh you start worshiping gods that don't care about what we would call today social justice, <laughs> right? Does that sound does that sound fair? Yeah, I think the the constant uh, vision of of both testaments in Scripture is um, is anti imperial because God is anti imperial. Mm -hmm. um, God chooses this lowly people um, at the beginning to kind of work in partnership with to accomplish God's purposes in the world. God doesn't choose the giant empires of the day. Israel never is a giant empire of its day. It's always, uh, Walter Brueggemann has an essay called Always in the Shadow of Empire. Oh. Um, Israel is always in the shadow of empire. I love that idea. Um, and and the empires of the day, like Babylon, Babylon uh, Assyria, and then Rome later, um, all have this idea that, um, you know, there's one on the top. There's there's one ruler, and everybody else is to be dominated. And this is the way the God wants it. If you read the Babylonian uh, flood narrative, yes, uh, you know, humans are created to um, essentially be slaves for the gods, and um, the biblical witness, the the Judeo Christian kind of witness uh, to to an alternative reality is that humans are not created to uh, be enslaved to the gods, but to be really uh, partners with the divine. Mm. And, and humans are not meant to domineer over each other, but to always work in partnership. Mm. Uh, and so when we get that, uh, following these other gods is following these other ideas about what power should be used for. And, mm -hmm. and so this, it's not, it, it's both and it's, it's following this true God who is a God of justice. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. in the Babylonian flood story, the gods flood the earth because the humans are too noisy, yes. right? They're like, they're partying too loud and the gods can't sleep, right? right. 
<laughs> and this is so important because uh, in the story in Genesis, you could call this an apocalyptic story, I guess. Right. Uh, it's not that humans are noisy. It's that humans are violent. Uh, yeah. it, the story in Genesis says they are wicked and violent. Like it repeats that. Right. And yeah. so wickedness and violence are kind of grouped together in uh, these apocalyptic stories. Uh, God solves the problem um, by with violence in there, but there's this anti-violent story, uh, anti-violent message in there that all of this violence is going to bring about a flood of uh, your own violence. It's going to kill you. And God tries to wash that away in the story. So there's a way in which you can read that as an anti-violent story. Um, and how... How does the book of Revelation have an, it, it, does it have an anti-violent story? I mean, we think of Revelation as so violent. Um, what is, what is Revelation doing with violence, do you think? Yeah, I think um, there's a similar logic. Uh, the flood thing is a, a rabbit trail, but yep. um, it, uh, just to say real fast, um, it, about the Genesis flood story, it's disturbing but if you follow the logic, the flood is is letting chaos have its way, which is really what the humans were doing, right? By killing each other and, and flooding the earth with violence, God just kind of says, okay, if this is what you want, we'll let chaos have, have its way. Um, there's a similar logic, a nonviolent logic in Revelation. Um, there is clearly a non-participant. God doesn't fight fire with fire. God doesn't fight violence with violence. Um, early on in Revelation, uh, Revelation 4 and 5, John sees a vision of the heavenly throne room. And um, in chapter 5, what John sees is in the midst of the throne, meaning the center of power of, of the entire universe, um, is a lamb standing as if slain. So it's this lamb that's dead, but standing um, and ruling in power, right? But not by the power of violence or domination or economic extraction and, and wealth, but uh, through uh, self-giving love, mm -hmm. right? So right there, you see a clue that uh, this is not going to go the way of violence. This is mm -hmm. a lamb who has, uh, who has given himself. Uh, for the good of others we we typically uh um the metaphor for god for jesus is typically uh, a lion yeah. <laughs> um right like even in uh c.s lewis's great uh works on <laughs> narnia right uh it's aslan right. the lion but um why why i why don't you think that we have a lamb? Why don't, why is, why isn't it instead of like the lion being the dominant image for God or for uh, Jesus? I mean, you like uh, the, the lion of Judah, right. Mm -hmm. Is, is deeply rooted in the biblical tradition, but it gets replaced in revelation. Uh, Joshua asks, explain to us uh, revelation chapter four. Well, we're doing it now, Joshua. So here we go. Right. Uh, this is where John is expecting to see a lion even yeah. hears what he thinks is the roar of a lion. But when he looks, it's this lamb that's been slain since the foundation of the world. So why is it that we keep going back to the lion when <laughs> it's a slain lamb? Yeah. Well, yeah, he does. So there's a difference in chapter five. It's very interesting. Um, John sees there's a scroll in the hand of the one on the throne, and this is the scroll of, of I think, what God intends to do. There's lots of different interpretations of the scroll. My own interpretation is this is God's intentions for um, working in history, um, and no one can open it, right? And so uh, he weeps, and, um, and then the angel says to him, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, mm -hmm. and he can open the scroll. And so you think, right, this is that lion image that comes right in. He yeah. hears the lion. Um, but then he, when he turns, he sees this lamb standing in the midst of the throne, standing as if slain. Um, well, I think, why do we keep going back to the lion? Um, the, the lamb is costlier for us. It's, it's harder to follow the lamb, which is the call of Revelation is to follow this lamb 
which is the call of the Gospels. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It's the same call in Revelation. Um, I don't know that the lion is replaced so much as these two things, this happens a few different times in Revelation where John will hear something and then turn and see something mm. that he wasn't expecting. And I think they're kind of mutually informing one another. The lion is an image of power, is an, is a kingly image, like a, a, an image of reign and rule. Uh, but it but it has to be in, interpreted through the lamb. So So it is the lamb who rules, right? It's this reigning image but it's the lamb uh, yeah. standing as if slain and and um uh boy barbara rossing and uh brian blunt call this lamb power oh, right uh, yeah. and it's the power of love it's the power of self-giving love yeah. non-violence yeah, yeah that's good um uh uh, one of the people i follow you know uh renee gerard uh has influenced me quite a bit uh he helped me understand that uh, this language about the lamb being uh, slain since the foundations of the world um, is a reference back to the foundation of culture where uh, Cain kills Abel and Jesus identifies with Abel uh, there at the beginning. Uh, label, Abel is the lamb slain since the foundation of the world. And it seems like maybe Revelation is playing a whole lot with the uh, first Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so you might have like, uh, allusions to even Abel, uh, in that story. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, is also brought up a lot. Uh, what's the interplay that John has with, uh, the Hebrew scriptures? Yeah. Interestingly enough, there is not a single quotation from the Hebrew scriptures in the book of revelation. Oh, really? That's rare. <laughs> Cause most new Testament books, maybe all of them quote, something. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a direct quote at all, but basically every sentence in Revelation is echoing or mm. alluding to uh, something from the prophets, something from Genesis. I mean, it's all, it's it's kind of funny because it's all over the place, but it's never quoted. Yeah. It's very interesting yeah. to me that I don't know how he did that without quoting it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's interesting. laughs> uh, Joshua says, what gets me is that Revelation is about power corruption and lies of the roman empire you want to say a little bit more about that sure yeah so there's several places where um there is a very strong contrast between um, imperial power and um, lamb power and so one of those places is um well there's it's all over the place yeah. one of those places is chapter 13 though uh, where the beast comes out of the sea and um, the people worship the beast. And this beast is is very much meant to to invoke imperial power, domination. And um, I'll just go there. The uh, There's actually, so my book traces uh, a lot of the hymns that are sung throughout Revelation. Revelation has a lot of uh, songs of worship. Mm. to to God and the Lamb. There's actually a song of worship um, given to the beast as well. Um, in, in chapter 13, verse 4, um, and I think this is such a contrast, right? So the Lamb is worshipped because he was slain uh, and, and he conquered by nonviolence. He conquered mm. by giving uh, him, him, himself in love. Uh, but the beast is worshipped in verse 4 of 13. They worshipped uh, the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? So mm. the hymn of worship is this hymn to dominating violence. Who can fight against the beast? Mm. Right? And uh, that's, I f the hymns always tell the truth about what's what's really going on and this hymn tells exactly the truth that this beast is violent mm. and dominating and um and it's such a contrast to the hymns uh to the lamb uh so th chapter 13 is is a great uh contrast and there's a lot more there uh chapter 18 is another contrast um 
of uh, it's an economic critique. So mm -hmm. um, the um, this is the fall of Babylon, and so um, it's it's a song. It's another song uh, from all of the people who benefited from uh, Babylon's. And Babylon is code word for Rome. Uh, Babylon's uh, opulence and economic uh, power. Uh, so it's the merchants and all the other people who who made themselves rich by participating in that un, uh, unjust economy, and um, so you see uh, the the song of woe here about all of this stuff, and and you can see what they're lamenting, the loss of what they're lamenting um, is all of the resources that were extracted out of these outlying areas. And John is writing to one of those outlying areas, Asia Minor, right? Yeah. Asia Minor is not the center of empire. It's it's on the margins. Um, but the, all of these people are lamenting the loss of the cargo that they used to trade in and even lamenting um, that they used to trade in human souls and uh, slavery. And so yeah. uh, you can see there's a critique there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because... Um... You you had said earlier that uh, we want to keep with the lion imagery because the lamb imagery is so costly, right? But what Revelation is also saying is that either one of these options is costly, yeah, right? Like the way of Revelation, and that's what like the the curtain being revealed mm -hmm. um, is getting at, right? Like yeah. you don't see how much the way of Rome is costing you is costing maybe even like the people who are in power. Uh, right. But certainly costing, uh, those who are on, on the underside of, uh, of power of empire. Uh, and that's where like you get to see the connections, uh, today to what you might call the American empire. Right. And how costly it is, um, the ways that, that empire is working and destroying us too. It's like um, Heather McGee's book, uh, how racism costs all of us, yes. <laughs> not just black people, but white people and everybody. Yeah. I, I think James Baldwin made a point about that too. Like it's, it's costly for black people, but it's, it's stealing the soul of racists as well. And mm. I think that that's, yeah, that's a really insightful point about Revelation is um, it's problematic for all the people that are being put down and, and oppressed. It's it's costly for those folks who are being, uh, having their resources extracted and having to live hand to mouth, right? They, they have resources, but they're, they're being taken to Rome, yeah. uh, to the elite. Um, but it's also, I think, one of the things that John wants to say, you know, I, this is symbolic language, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not meant, like when we see all these things with 10 horns and things, you know, just try to sit down and draw a picture of that. You right, can't, yeah. right? It's not meant to be like, this is literally going to happen. It's communicating on the level of symbols to say, yeah, you're making um, a dystopia. You're making a hellish place here. And this is this is the outcome of that. No, and it's, no. it's being judged, therefore, justly in that way. It's, it's be, the truth is being told about uh, what, what has been created. Mm. By it's, being, it's being judged justly. Yeah, I, I, so, um, I, you know, judgment is a loaded yeah. word these days. Um, but I think... Uh, when we think about the victims of empire, yeah. Uh, yeah. telling the truth is uh, talking about judgment and justice to say like, this is wrong. Mm. Uh, there's a better way to do this. And uh, we shouldn't live with this. We shouldn't just say, oh, well, <laughs> right? <laughs> like people are getting, uh, you know, people are, refugees are, are, getting swamped in in uh, oceans as they try to find a, a place that's free of war and famine oh well right like no we should say that's wrong and we should do otherwise that's judgment mm, i love it is that how you interpret the cups of wrath that are seen in kind of the middle sections of the book of revelation because wrath yeah. is also like you know a loaded term 
Wrath. <laughs> um, yeah. What's going I, on with those cups of wrath? Do you think? Yeah, I don't love the term wrath uh, these days. I think it, mainly it's it's an English translation of a of a Greek word. We can translate it otherwise. David Bentley Hart has helpfully, for me, translated it as um, indignation. Um, uh, he does this in Romans. I, I can't remember if he translates it um, that way in Revelation, but I think it would work. Because what is indignation? It's justified anger in the face of injustice, mm, right? And I mm. so wrath, the etymology of wrath comes from like a word that talks about cruelty. Yeah. Right? And I don't think that's worthy of God in the scriptures. Um, God is not... Um, pictured image as cruel. Um, but God does care about justice, clearly from page one to yeah. you know, the last page of, of the Bible. Uh, God is a God who cares about the poor and cares about the oppressed and cares about justice and is upset, rightfully upset when we um, exploit uh, our siblings. And um, so, yeah, I think there is... Um, there is some judge. There's clearly a lot of judgment going on, um, but it's not indiscriminate, right? I think mm. the key in Revelation is it's not just like destruction being visited upon random, like wherever and everything. Um, it's it's focused, and again, Revelation is communicating at the level of symbols. So one of the symbols is worship of the beast, right? Is this constant like? Like Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody, right? It's going to be the, in, in Revelation schema, it's either going to be the lamb and following lamb power, or it's going to be the beast and following beast power. And, you know, that there's just, in John's worldview, there's no middle ground. Um, and obviously, we would talk about complexity outside of the literary nature of Revelation. But in the, in the literary imagination of John, there's, there's these two ways. And so the judgment is visited upon those who worship the beast, who, who benefit from uh, beast power. Mm. Um, and lamb power is really entering into this costly alternative. And, and we're bad at that. We just try, right? Yeah. Like that's the best we can do is try to opt out in ways mm. that we can to say, no, we don't want to participate in uh, these structures. And we're going to try to make better structures that are um, that are more just and equitable. That's the response that John wants us to have to these oppressive economic and political and religious systems is in your book. Uh, the title of your book is silence. Uh, so it's kind of this non participation in those systems. Is that what John is trying to get us to do? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes people have a sense that revelation is about, um, widespread persecution happening for Christians. And there's most scholars uh, now say there's no evidence that that was going on when John was writing this. There's no widespread persecution that happens later. Um, there is some persecution under Nero, but it's not systematic and wide widespread. Um, that's a later thing. Um, what John seems to be concerned about, especially when you read the seven letters at the beginning, uh, the, these letters from Jesus, that uh, actually comfort and uh, cooperation with these uh, unjust systems is the problem. And, and Jesus in these letters is trying to wake them up from their comfortable slumber and say, look, you've got to be faithful. Uh, you're too comfortable. You're too wealthy. You're too... Uh, you're too entrenched in these systems. And so, yes, in my book, I trace this, I, the, the um, audible things, uh, silence and praise, because uh, the Revel book of Revelation is so sensory, right? Mm. There's, there's, um, I've, I've written a, a book on the use of color in Revelation, because if you pay attention to that, there's some interesting things that happen. Because uh, there's all kinds of colors and mm. uh, there's all kinds of loud sounds. It's bombastic. I, I think we've got to do a better job of reading this book uh, with our senses. Mm. Um, and we'll pick up some things that we haven't seen. But I do trace the, the audi auditory things here. And so silence I'm reading as a um, 
as an image of non-participation. Um, for if you read the book, you'll see there's there's the three cycles: um, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Um, and so they each kind of deal with uh, with silence in their own way, and each deal with uh, some noisy praise. So silence, I, I read as the non-participation in these systems. John is calling them to, uh, and at the end of Revelation, there is silence um, in Babylon. No more will be heard the sound of the mill workers or the celebration of the bride and groom, right? There's the, the very mm -hmm. evocative, like, uh, this is a ghost town almost. It's just eerily silent. Well, what do we see in the next chapter? We see the wedding feast of the lamb mm. and, and the lamb's bride. So there's no wedding celebration in Babylon, but there's a boisterous wedding celebration in the next chapter. Uh, and so um, silence is the non-participation and praise is where the real party is at, is what John is saying. Like praise is mm. the uh, kind of just participation in in the new creation. And mm. that's what John is trying to get his audience to do, to, to try to disengage from the idolatry and injustice of their own day, uh, which is costly, but showing them that there is um, benefit to that. It's not just all doom and gloom, right? Like there's a new creation that you look forward to, beautiful, just, equitable, um, uh, super abundant new creation. So is John uh, inviting his the reader to participate in that new, those new things that, is he saying those things are emerging now, these alternative ways of relating to one another, this kind of alternative economic system is emerging now within our midst? Yeah, I, th I think in in partial and fragmentary ways, right? Yeah. Um, that uh, there's going to be a whole lot of uh, hardship in disengaging with um, some of these systems. You know, for if you just think about like a a baker uh, in the in the first century world, a, a, a Christian baker in Asia Minor, um, you might have to belong to a guild. To practice a trade mm. and that guild would have their own gods and dues that would be paid to offer sacrifices and john is calling them to to not do that or there were sometimes um parades through town and the city council would give out money to the citizens uh to decorate their homes to honor the gods and so if you're a christian uh and you get money to decorate your home for this celebration, but you don't do it, uh, it's going to be very conspicuous. You're gonna stand out, and mm -hmm. then you might draw some ire from your neighbors. Um, people might, if you're a baker, people might stop coming to your bakery. So it's not gonna be easy. And so the constant call is patient endurance in Revelation. Um, that's repeated again and again. This calls for patient endurance of the saints. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. going to be easy. But in the meantime, yes, I think, um, obviously, to disengage for John from some of these unjust and idolatrous systems calls for true worship and uh, just participation, you know, share, economic sharing uh, amongst the community. Um, so, yeah, it's breaking out. The, the new creation uh, is not just far flung in the future. It's it, we're meant to embody it. Uh, Raylene says, after my SBC upbringing, I just enjoy discussions on revelation that are time slash culture related and make more sense than the fear and intimidation drilled into me as a young person. Yeah. Uh, Joshua says, John was tripping, LOL. The imagery is fantastic. What? So there have been all kinds of theories about John and maybe he's on some kind of psychedelic or something while he's <laughs> writing these things. Uh, you, you, I, I don't, maybe you do give that some credence. I don't know. Like where does, I think, I think the first century ancient mind is maybe far more imaginative about these things than, uh, than we typically are today. Um, but but I don't know. What do you what do you think about that theory? Yeah. Well, I know my brain doesn't necessarily work like that. Uh -huh. but, um, 
but I think people's, you know, I think the first century, they don't have television. Mm-hmm. They don't have social media, right? right. So right. their brains aren't rotting away from things like yeah. that. But, <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, we have, there's some creativity involved here. There's, there's, mm-hmm. I think there's vision. In, John has a vision. Clearly, yeah. you can't make this stuff up, right? right. right. Uh, there's something mm-hmm. happening. He sees something, um, and often enough, I think he's a little flummoxed by what he sees, because um, throughout the book he says, "I saw something like this thing," right? Yeah. Um, so it's not exact. You know, I think he's a little overwhelmed by what he's seeing. This is. You know, like when you have a weird dream, you're like, I don't know how to make sense of that. He's something like this thing happened. Right. Um, so even John is is a little overwhelmed by it. But I, I think about we've got. We've got creative people nowadays, so mm-hmm. people's brains still work in these kinds of, you know, how, how do you. I don't think you have to be on a substance. It's just uh, you have to have that kind of. Uh, somebody said, um, uh, I think it was Joshua said, read, read Revelation with the right side of your brain, right? Like, uh, yeah. John, I think, is a right-brained person. Uh, yeah. Paul is very left-brained, right? Like, he's okay. rhetorical, his arguments are linear, and uh, but, but John is all over the place. It's kind of hard to read Revelation unless you're reading with the right brain. Yeah. 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 I love it. Uh, Joshua also says, uh, now are there two or three stories happening simultaneously between chapters five and 19? Um, Ah, That's, that's so specific. I don't know if you can answer that, but uh, there's probably a lot of things happening between chapter five and 19. Uh, But I did want to bring in chapter 19. I think it's in chapter 19 where Jesus comes back on the horse and, uh, Right. And has yeah. the sword coming from his mouth and mm-hmm. uh, kills all kinds of things. And this is a sort of a problematic uh, passage chapter in the book mm-hmm. of Revelation. It's been used by many Christians for Christian nationalism and Christian power. And uh, yeah, Jesus might be the lamb at one point, but he's coming back with a sword in uh, with a sword and tattoos on his legs. And he's going to cause all kinds of hell and kill all kinds of the bad guys. Um, right. And so what, what do we do with uh, Revelation 19 and Jesus with the uh, sword coming from his mouth? Yeah, yeah, and his his robe is dipped in blood too, yes. right? So I mean, lots of imagery that if you want to interpret it towards violence, it, this text can do a lot of damage. Um, I think one thing that's really important is to see um, we've got to see the whole book of Revelation together, and we've got to see it as a, a literary whole. I think sometimes when people piecemeal revelation up and then try to connect different things to different events in the world, whether those are like world historical events through the centuries or whether they're uh, current events like the Russia-Ukraine war. I'm sure I I don't follow biblical prophecy, but I'm sure they're having a heyday with that kind of stuff Uh, right now. So um, that's, that's to piecemeal the book up. And I think that works against our understanding We've got to remember that um, there's uh, there's like composite imagery for for Jesus here. Jesus is imaged as a lamb at the very beginning of the book. He's he's in the white shining garb. His face is shining, mm-hmm. right? So that's a different image. We've got an image of one like the Son of Man coming from Daniel. He's on a cloud, right? So from Daniel's vision, um, there's an image there in in. Uh, chapter 16, 17. Um, and then, yeah, in 19, we have the rider on a white horse um, with a sword. But it's, I think it's significant that the sword is coming out of his mouth. This is speech. This is the word of testimony, which is, again, constantly uh, brought up in Revelation, is that lamb power is the the people that follow the lamb, their power is in their testimony, their witness. Uh, Brian Blunt has a great book called Can I Get a Witness, where he connects Mm -hmm. uh, lamb power to the civil rights movement and to hip hop music as as testimony. Um, I highly recommend that book. It's just fantastic. Um, 
And so, um, yeah, it's the sword is coming out of his mouth. This is not um, this not a sword in his hand where he's going to cut down uh, his enemies. Uh, this is the word of his testimony, which is constantly that's from the very first image of the lamb, right? The the uh, power of his testimony is is held out, and um, in Revelation twelve, uh, the people that are um, I'll just go to that too. Um, so Revelation 12, uh, verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down mm. who accuses them day and night before our God, but they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So they conquered by the lamb's blood, not other people's blood, not shedding other people's blood, and by the word of their testimony to that victory. And so here we have the sword coming from the mouth. That's the word of testimony. And his robe is dipped in blood, but we've already seen countless times in chapter 5, chapter 12, all kinds of places. This is his own blood, mm. uh, that he's not out to shed a bunch of blood. Yeah, yeah. It it goes along with the what what I think is the fundamental ethic when it comes to violence and nonviolence throughout the New Testament, but especially in the book of Revelation, uh, where it says uh, to the people of God in Roman or sorry, Revelation 13, uh, that if something like if you are to be taken captive into captivity, you shall go all who live by the sword, die by the sword. Right. So mm -hmm. there's that there's that reference to Jesus's uh, statement when Peter cuts off the the uh, soldier's ear uh, and Jesus says, put your sword back in its place for all who live by the sword, die by the sword. This seems to be uh, the ethic, the, the nonviolent ethic that runs throughout uh, the New Testament that you see so clearly in the book of Revelation. It seems to me, especially in Revelation 13 and when they have like when the middle sections i think it's 17 and 18 of revelation where it talks about the wars of the the kings to the north and the kings to the south go to war against each other all of the human violence yeah. is done by the kings of the earth not by the people of god who are told to be maybe not passive in the face of violence but to to live in a non-violent ethic that, as John Lewis says, will cause you some good trouble and they might come after you because you are causing that kind of good trouble, right? Does right. that does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, again, that patient endurance. Yeah. Uh, that's that's called for. Um, uh, the, the word uh, in Greek is hupomone, remaining under is the mm -hmm. image that word says. So it's like kind of patiently enduring the, the thing that's happening without uh, violently resisting it without pushing against it in, yeah. that, in that kind of conflictual way. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Maybe John can't get beyond violent imagery or something. I don't know because in revelation 19, uh, Jesus has the sword coming from the mouth. Uh, and, but he doesn't go into a whole lot of detail, uh, describing this war of the lamb or war of Jesus or whatever. Uh, but, he does strike the nations with the rod, mm -hmm. right? And destroys the nations. I think that's, I think it says something like that. And then uh, the kings of the earth are killed in Revelation 19. But what happens immediately, like in the next chapter, is you have the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations. <laughs> so whatever is happening in, chapter 19 is not the end of the nations there's the healing of the nations that's going to come right and it's not yeah. the end of the story of the kings who throughout the book of revelation are almost scapegoated maybe they're mm -hmm. they are like the cause of all the problems of the earth they are the ones who are um committing fornication with the beasts right this is this is like the kings are like the big problem here when it comes to like the human level but even in the book even in the end of the book of revelation the kings who have just been like killed now are coming into the new the new heaven and the new earth and bringing in their glory so there's still something 
of glory that the kings are bringing in are these i mean i'm sure that there are all kinds of ways that you can interpret what's going on here it could be like different kings but uh <laughs> the book of revelation never talks about different kings all right. the kings are bad and wicked mm -hmm. but here they are bringing that must maybe they're transformed maybe the nations are transformed maybe the healing of the nations uh is pointing to something beyond i don't know yeah i again this is why we can't read this work literally um and even not necessarily linearly yes um because yes so the um striking down the nations ruling them with a rod of iron is um is a reference to psalm 2. Mm. so that's a, a messianic psalm go back and read psalm 2. um you'll see that kind of, again it's constantly echoing all of this imagery from the psalms from genesis from exodus everywhere um but yes if if the kings are all killed right in 19 and then um man they're also like thrown in the uh, the lake of fire in yeah. chapter 20 yeah. after they were killed yeah uh, and then in chapter 21 they're entering the city they're bringing their their glory into the into the city um you can't read that linear linearly you can't read that literally but there are lots there's images here and i think mm -hmm. that what's being played with is uh kings who are uh committed to the way of injustice and self-enrichment are that's that's the way of death that's not yeah. a good way it's not going to end up good we can see that right when when people rise up against oppression uh it usually doesn't go well for the kings or at the very least they're they don't hold on to their power um and um that's a way of destruction. That's not the way of the new creation where, where the kings are invited to bring um, good things and participate in the city. And, and they don't have to, they somehow don't have to give up being kings. Yeah. Right? There's, I, they're called kings. Yeah. Yeah. There's a just that, way to rule. That's really interesting. It's been a while since I uh, studied the Roman emperors, but during this time, uh, they don't last very long. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are some who do, but there's a lot of like, this is where like the way of Rome is not good for those who are in power, ultimately for the emperor himself. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, like uh, palace intrigue, you could say there's all kinds like like when you are. Well, it's it's like uh, when you are the king, the one on top, you're just the next scapegoat. Like you're just yeah. you're you're the next person who's on the chopping block. It's like when we put people up on pedestals just yeah. to knock them down so that we can feel good about ourselves. Right. The King, the emperor in the way of Rome is the next target for the person who wants to be the next emperor <laughs> or who wants power. Right. I mean, right. that's where, that's where this whole system destroys people who are benefiting from it, who are uh, in so quote control of it because you're never in control of the beast in yeah. the book of revelation right the beast is in control and it doesn't care about you uh it only cares about more and more power yeah that kind of power is dehumanizing yeah um and and, and we see it like we see it in our world but yep. I, it reminds me of the twilight episode twilight zone episode uh the, of the dictator who's constantly worried about like who's gonna like come after his power and in the end of the episode like he looks in the mirror and i think the mirror image like kills him right oh. like that's it's it's actually himself like it's his love of power that does him in yeah yeah and his fear of losing it so Oof. Oof. but the gates are never shut in the new creation right so i again like all of these people uh who were supposedly done away with right this is i think one of the things that i've i've seen you know, that I didn't see earlier reading Revelation. Um, but I see now is like all of these people were supposed supposed to have been done away with. But uh, John describes the city and the city whose gates are never shut uh, uh, by day and it's never night. So they're never mm. shut. Mm. And um, and then he says outside are all these other people. Right. 
and and you're like wait where did all these other people come from and if if they're outside could they also come inside that i think so yep right because the yeah. gates aren't shut they're not excluded they're just not living into the vision right yeah and it's it's interesting because some of those people uh are like they're described as fornicators right but the kings have been fornicating the whole time and here they are making it in right and so it's just this like as you say you can't take it winterly it's all over the place um what with your with your work on paul um the kings are sent into the lake of fire could paul in first corinthians 3 i think it is mm -hmm. uh jesus also says this too that we will all be salted with fire before mm -hmm. we make it into the into the kingdom, right? Uh, uh, Paul in First Corinthians three, I think it is, where he says, "Nobody, you can't build on any other foundation other than Christ." And you, we're all going to go through the fire, and the wood and the hay, the stuff that doesn't, uh, shouldn't make it in, will be burned away. But the precious gold and silver will make it in. Is that like? Uh, is that maybe what John is doing in, with the lake of fire imagery and? uh the, the the kings and stuff i mean that's not as explicit as paul is but right maybe that's maybe the bad maybe this is kind of like a purgatory that our catholic friends uh might say is is happening here i don't know yeah i you know you you wonder i mean the image is is pretty gruesome yeah uh, of the lake of fire but um but it's not the end of revelation there's two right. more chapters after yes. that yes. and um I think sometimes, yeah, we've tended to read, um, we've tended to read poorly the imagery of Revelation, which is meant to communicate as imagery. Yes. Um, and, you know, like I said, just try to sit down and draw this stuff and you can't right. do it. So if yes. you can't do it, then you're, <laughs> then there's got to be a better, a better way to read this. Um, people will, some students, when I teach Revelation, will sometimes say, is, is the imagery meant to be symbolic or literal of uh, Revelation? I say, really neither. It's meant to be theological. Mm. Uh, and, and there's a theological call to, to worship God, to disengage from idolatry and injustice, um, and to, to follow the, in Revelation 14, to follow the Lamb yeah. wherever he goes. Mm. And, you know, he he doesn't go down the way of of dominating power and and the ways sometimes revelation has been used um somebody mentioned um the the middle east right um uh, yeah. the way revelation has been used to stoke violence and oppression in um israel and palestine is is super unfortunate and um it's it's not a good reading of revelation we need better readings Mm -hmm. Raylene says the lion and the lamb shall lie together in peace. <laughs> That's a great, great uh, reference there, uh, Raylene. Power and truth is a mix of what we consider strength in those two dynamics, uh, the lion and the lamb. That's good. Uh, Jeff asks, do you think there is any influence in Revelation to the stories in the book of Enoch or the books of Enoch? Yeah, I think, I mean, Enoch is a is a classic apocalyptic text revelatory um and i think there's definitely um some stuff there um uh, it's been a while since i worked with that but um uh noah is an important figure for enoch and i think there's some um uh, echoes of of noah things happening in revelation as well there's a rainbow um, around the throne uh, in, in John's uh, yeah. heavenly throne room scene. So what is the Noah story but a story of, of uh, creation and new creation, right? So um, I think there's ideas there. There is going to be some unmaking. Uh, again, in my book, I, I, I talk about rhetorical cosmology um, because it's, it's a war of cosmologies. Uh, between Rome's, where Rome is at the center, and when Romans, Roman power and, and Caesar is dominating the rest of the world, everything in its, is in its right place. That's mm. the world that the Roman gods wish there to be. 
you know, we we think about this way in, in American empire, right? When America's on top, that's the way God wants it. God bless America is not, we want God to bless America. We want God to bless yeah. the whole world. But when, usually when we invoke that, it's about God bless our power and domination and, and, um, and our elitism over everything else. Um, John begs to differ. He has a different cosmology. So there's an unmaking of that Roman discourse. This is what, what my book is getting at. It's it's not meant to be literal, like destruction of the earth. That's not what God desires. But it's this unmaking of the Roman hold on mm. the cosmology and the emergence of this new creation, which is mm. with the lamb at the center. Well, this is this is getting at uh, one of the big questions. Uh, uh, Joshua says, would we say revelation is specifically about rome uh and as i was reading your book i was like um you know babylon is this symbolic word for rome right uh, and there are all kinds of empires that the book of revelation talks about but really it's about uh, it seems to me like it's about uh the way of you might call it the way of empire or uh the way of power or something like that which is not it, which for the book of revelation is about Rome because that's mm -hmm. the uh, historical context that it's in, but it's about any kind of uh, way of life that is about power and domination over others. So uh, revelations critique would be just as valid in any other kind of empire. I think so. And that's yeah. why John can call Rome Babylon, right? Yeah. That there's a historical precedent for that. And, uh, and clearly there's, pre uh, there's things that follow after Rome that, that, uh, would be critiqued under the same banner. So, um, what, what does this all mean for those of us living in the American empire? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, am I supposed to like, uh, how, how do I, uh, what would John say uh, about uh, the United States uh, today uh, about not just, well, the United States, but also uh, our economic system? Uh, what would John say? Like, is it okay if I still purchase things from Amazon? I, I don't know. I feel, yeah. I, as I read your book, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so relevant to our world today and the way that businesses run and my iPhone is made by slaves in Africa. And yeah. how do I not participate in the economic systems, the political systems that we have today? I just feel like John would be writing to the churches in the United States and being mm -hmm. like, you have no idea what it is that you are participating in and yeah. how awful it is. Right. Yeah. So I think definitely uh, there is a word of critique for um those who are comfortable and comfortably entrenched in and benefit from systems of oppression um there is a word that should cause us some discomfort or more than a little probably um that is meant to unsettle right the, from from the letters the letters are meant to unsettle these comfortable some of the churches get uh, commendation. And it's because they are not comfortable. They're suffering. They they yeah, are yeah. undergoing costly witness to the way of Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, you're right. You're right where I want you to be, right? This is this is good because you're not participating in this in idolatry and injustice. Um, others think they're doing great, you know, um, and he says, "You you think you you've got everything together, but you don't realize that you're you're poor and naked in the dark, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That's the truth of wh where you really are. And I think that's the word of critique that would come to us. And it is it's a hard word. Um, what is not called for though is a heroic effort. Mm. Um, this is not an individualistic calling because um, you can't disengage." From systems of impression of, of, of oppression on an individual basis, right? It, it's it's a systemic problem. It's going to call for a systemic solution, and so one of those calls, I think, is to um, 
at least what I see in John, it may differ a little bit in our context, but is to get communal, right? Are there ways that we can get uh, what we would call churches, right? Like groups, uh, groups of folks who want to um, imagine a better way to be human together um, and, and actually start to practice that to share food, to share resources, to care for um, people that are suffering under, um, you know, uh, unbridled capitalism, uh, to house people without housing, um, things like that, um, I think are, that's the call. So it's not a, hero like, I mean, should we not buy stuff from Amazon? I I've got to look at mm. myself in the mirror, right? right? Oh, now, yeah. So, uh, I'm too comfortable probably. And so uh, there are better ways. Um, I'm not going to be able to do the, the better ways thing just by myself. I'm going to have to find a community that's going to live into, into this together. So it's a critique, but there's also a word of hope um, that uh, there are better ways. Revelation 21 and 22 shows us um, a way of, uh, non-violence, a way of abundance rather than scarcity that creates a kind of fear, right? When we think about there's scarce resources, what do we do? We close the gates. Well, the, the heavenly city's gates are never closed, right? There's not a fear of scarcity. There's a sense of abundance. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations, mm -hmm. which I think is an ongoing work, right? I don't think they're just zapped. I think so we get to participate in uh, the healing of, of working for peace. Mm. Um, now, there's a whole, you know, what's not addressed a lot in Revelation is the folks who are run under the wheel of empire. And, and um, you know, because a lot of this is addressed to the comfortable people. But yeah. for the folks who are, you know, run under the wheel of empire, there there is, I think, a word of hope uh, that God does not condone that. Mm. Um, and and that that's not real power uh, and that there's uh, going to be rectification yeah there there it's it's I, I think you said earlier uh something like this is not how the world is supposed to be yeah. which is a huge message throughout the biblical witness there's something wrong with the world and uh so don't don't accept the world uh on the world's terms <laughs> Right. There's a sense in which we can just start um, getting, I don't know, bulldozed by the world and just think this is how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I maybe the hope is like, this is not how it's supposed to be. Uh, and there's, as you say, ways we can work to build something different together. I keep thinking of uh, mutual aid, which maybe is the yeah. more secular uh, term that we have today for what John is getting out for what what church could be uh, a way of aiding uh, one another in mutuality. Yeah, I think that's really right. I, I just think of the critique. It's quite a critique if you live in a superpower, yep. uh, if you live in an empire, um, of which we are clearly, you know, the most dominant, but there's other ones. But just think about like going to the halls of Congress and saying, this is not, how the world's supposed to be. That's a critique of that mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. In Putin's Russia, to go there and say, this is not how the world is supposed to be, will be costly yep. if, if you raise that protest. Um, and so um, it is a critique. It, it, this is, I don't, I can't read it otherwise as, right. as a, uh, you know, uh, one author sees all the beastly imagery and animalistic imagery. Rome used to um, ostracize the outer limits of the empire by talking about all the beasts that were out there. And what John is doing from like an Asia Minor mm. context, right? The backwater of the empire is saying, actually, you know what the like, you know, what the marginal beastly stuff is? It's at the center of Rome. That's mm. the stuff. That's the scary. Oh, that's the the mirror of the uh, Twilight Zone reference that you get. At. Right. That was that was perfect. Uh, hi, Rhonda. Good morning to you. 
and uh, Fatima says maybe about ego. Yeah, I, a lot of a lot of ego and dying to the self that the New Testament uh, calls us to. Um, it's good good observation there. And Princess says thank you, Doctor Hansen, for your insights. Uh, thank you for this, Ryan. Anything else you want to you want to say about the Book of Revelation before we before we wrap things up? I think we covered a whole lot uh, in an hour, and it's always a pleasure to talk with you about all well, kinds of topics. So, yeah, thank you, Adam, and and to everybody who who listened and comment. Great comments and uh, got me thinking, right? Uh, and questions that that were challenging. So I really appreciate it. Um, I think Revelation should be read. Um, read, uh, read it closely. Um, read it with a good guide. So there's lots of good uh, books out there. I, I think one of the more accessible ones uh, is Michael Gorman's book, Reading Revelation Responsibly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really helpful text to get into this. I, I also like Richard Baucom's uh, The Theology of the Book of Revelation. I've called that the best book written on Revelation. Oh, wow. Um, it's really, it's pretty tiny, but it's jam-packed. Um, he really gets into the imagery. We have to read this. Um, I, I really liked um, uh, Joshua's um, reading with the right brain because that's exactly what mm. I want to do. I I want to, um, one of the projects that's on the back burner for me is um, doing a, a book that attends to sight and sound in Revelation uh, yeah. as, as interpretive keys. So... Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, Ryan, my friend, thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure thank talking you. with you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, watching. And uh, you can keep up with one question with Pastor Adam wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you listen to a podcast uh, platform where you can rate and review, I would love for you to do that for me. It helps get the message out. You can share this episode with uh, anybody you think you might be interested Uh uh, Jeff, I will try to post these book references uh, here on this page. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll do that. Um, and uh, friends, we will do this all again next week, uh, Thursday, I think at our normal time, 11 o'clock Pacific. Uh, until then, friends, I uh, hope you have a great rest of your week and uh, God be with you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>